So tonight, I, I think I'd like to offer um, this very special sutta, which is the Great Forty States, the Maha Chattari Sakka Sutta. And I think, to my, to my understanding, this is one of the best suttas out there uh, to explain the whole Eightfold Path and how it works. Like, not just like saying, like, this is the Eightfold Path, but here's how it works, basically, all together. Here's how all the limbs work together. And it's just, uh, um, when I read this, I was just really amazed because I never uh, understood the Eightfold Path like this, uh, how it actually worked. Uh, because it, it does have an action in it. it do, there is an engine, there is a verb, there is an action, a path in this, and there's a way in which these things work together. And this is that sutta. And here they are, the monks and the Buddha are in Anatta Bindiga's park, in Jeta's, Jeta's grove. And I started with all these stories uh, of my own experience, how it happened for me, these experiences of different kinds of samadhis, different kinds of mental collectedness or concentration practices or purifications of the mind. And here is the Buddha's take on wise samadhi, basically. How does that happen? And the eight-spoke path is all about, basically, uh, culminating it's, it's the culmination of each of these spokes each of these limbs which culminate in wise samadhi this collectedness or mental purity or mental calmness basically in in another sutta the buddha says um, that the definition of samadhi is um, Chitta Sikagata. So this, um, the unification, but also tranquilizing of the mind. Basically, this is this is samadhi. And another of the questions that I had for a long time, many years, which Bhante Vimalaramsi answered at the very beginning when I started to hear his talks, is that very word ikagata. And in the traditional curriculum right now in Theravada Buddhism, this is uh, translated as, this is the word that is translated as one-pointed, ikka-gatta. But in fact, that word can also mean ekagga. <laughs> ekagga is tranquil, tranquility. Ikagata is like basically yeah tranquility uh, also so it can be seen as like a unified kind of tranquility but it doesn't necessarily mean one pointed or a pointy pointy thing it's got not really anything to do with pointy things <laughs> so here's wise collectedness samma samadhi as explained by the buddha because I will teach you the wise collectedness of the awakened ones. I have to make this bigger. With its supports and prerequisites, yes. Listen and apply your minds wisely to what I will say. And what is this wise collectedness of the awakened ones with its supports and, re and requisites? It is wise understanding, wise attitude or wise intention, wise speech, wise behavior, wise livelihood, wise practice, and wise presence of mind. So this would be right view, right intention, right action, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. But here, this is my own translation, so these terms are slightly different. 
So just right here, uh, we'll just pause two seconds and uh, take that in. The, this is the eight spoke path and he's basically saying Samadhi, wise Samadhi is the eight spoke path. So that's really interesting. Uh, it doesn't say anything about focusing or concentration or anything. He says basically this is wise, like wise understanding, wise attitude, wise speech, wise behavior, wise lifestyle, wise practice and wise presence of mind. So this is a very organic structure which brings this mental collectedness and this has its roots in every aspect of your life basically and so this is really important to understand. The tranquility of mind that is made up of these seven components that is called wise collectedness of the awakened people with its supports and prerequisites. So now, wise understanding. First, there must be wise understanding, monks. This is right view. One understands unwise understanding to be unwise understanding, and wise understanding to be wise understanding. So we need to tell these two things apart. This is wise understanding. <laughs> so to understand this is wise understanding. What is unwise understanding? That is, there is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no right nor wrong, nor any result, result of action done. There is no this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, devas, no world with Shramanas or Brahmanas who are practicing wisely, who explain this world and the world beyond through their own direct experience of it. So basically, uh, an el elaborated way to basically say that there's no karma, there's no, there's no wholesome states, there's no unwholesome state, all of that doesn't matter. There's no cultivation of the mind through wholesomeness. Uh, and then what is wise understanding? There are two kinds of wise understanding, monks. There is the wise understanding which is still under the sway of distractions or mental impurities, whereby merit must be performed and which matures by accumulation. So this is when we're in training, basically. We're, we're training to develop wise understanding. And there is the wise understanding which has no distractions or not tainted, basically. It is completely pure. And that remains unaffected by this world and actions, which is pure, the pure spoke of the path. So basically, there is this you know, ideal wise understanding which is perfect and then there's the whole way to get there. Basically, there's two kinds. The one that the wise understanding in an arahant's or uh, a fully awakened person's mind and the wise understanding of uh, the path that is being developed. And this is going to be a sequence uh, that is going to come out throughout the whole sutta, basically. Uh, there's two kinds of each of these wise spoke, there's two kinds of them the ideal one and the one that is in training, basically. Everybody following? <laughs> not, not too nerdy? <laughs> okay, good. What is wise understanding which is still under the sway of distractions whereby merit must be performed and which matures by accumulation? So we need to develop that and accumulate it. One understands there are things which are given, which are offered and sacrificed. There, there is right and wrong and the result of actions. This world exists and so does the other worlds. There is mother and father and beings who are reborn instantaneously. 
This world does exist with its shramanas and brahmanas who practice properly and who explain this world and the world after by their direct experience of it. When the Buddha is talking about this world and the next world or the other world is basically um, his discovery about karma and uh, the, 30, the 32 planes of existence. Uh, and uh, one thing the Buddha said was that someone who uh, doesn't believe in um, a next birth, basically a next uh, a, a next destination after this life, is very highly unlikely to be virtuous because it doesn't matter. It's like I'm gonna die and this is all gonna stop. So why should I do anything good? You know. So might as well just take everything that I can here and now. And this is the world we got right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I think he was pretty spot on. But um, <laughs> anyways, not, not telling you you have to believe in things that you don't want to believe. But uh, he said that it was at least, even though you don't know, at least um, it's a wise investment of your faith, basically, because it will lead you somewhere at least uh, likely to be good, um, likely to be more wholesome. This monk's is called wise understanding, which is still under the sway of distractions, whereby merits must be performed, and which matures in by accumulation. What is now? What is this wise understanding, which is void of distractions or impurities? which remains unaffected by this world, which is the pure spoke of the path. That is, the mind of the awakened ones, a mind without distractions, without asavas. The pure spoke of the path, it is discernment, the ability of discernment, the strength of discernment. So this is panya, uh, panya indriya, panya bala. So, for those of you who are uh, scholars in this. <laughs> the support of awakening of investigation of states. So, and this is also a sutta where it's really, uh, the Buddha is putting everything together, basically, really in a nice web, comprehensive web. Uh, in one who develops the path. So basically everyone here is doing this. So w w just these qualities are being developed as we're using the six R's, as we're meditating. It is the wise understanding which is a constituent of the path. One practices letting go of unwise understanding and giving rise to wise understanding. So this is an actual practice. It's not like a just doesn't happen without any causes or conditions. We, we are actually developing this. This is a meditator's wise practice, so the right effort. So this is how right effort works. We abandon unwise uh, understanding and we develop the wise understanding. With presence of mind that is sati, one lets go of unwise understanding and with presence of mind, one gives rise to wise understanding. So presence of mind is what is allowing us to see this and to be able to put that into action, basically. That's the point of sati. This is a meditator's wise presence of mind or mindfulness. In this way, these three components always gravitate and revolve around wise understanding. That is, wise understanding, wise practice, and wise presence of mind. So we need awareness, we need presence of mind, clarity of mind, to be able to, to discern, to apply wise understanding or right view, and to choose right view and abandon wrong view, basically, and that is wise practice. And every spoke of the path, this is the same template that the Buddha will explain here, basically. So this is the same thing with, with mindfulness. We apply wise practice using the template of 
right view, basically. This is what that means. Okay, so we've talked about the whole thing now. <laughs> First, there must be, okay, so wise intention, wise attitude. First, there must be wise understanding, monks. And monks is also you for this time being. Don't worry. <laughs> How? One knows unwise intention to be unwise intention, and wise intention to be wise intention. This is what one's wise understanding. So this is the right way of looking at things, telling things apart. What monks is unwise intention? This is the intention based upon sensory gratification, the intention based upon dislike or aversion, and the intention based upon agitation or uh, sometimes called violence. This is unwise intention. What is wise intention? There are two kinds of wise intentions, monk. There is wise intention with distractions whereby merits must be performed and which mature by accumulation. And there is the wise intention which is void of distractions and remains unaffected by this world and actions, which is purely the spoke of the path, basically, the ideal one, which we're all slowly training towards. What is wise intention which comes with distractions, uh, whereby merits must be performed? That is the intention of letting go, nikkama. That is the intention of uplifting the mind, abhyapada, non-anger. And the intention of non-agitation, avihimsa, or non-violence. This is wise intention, which is still under the sway of distractions, whereby merits must be performed and which matures by accumulation. Now, what is the wise, added, the wise intention, which is void of distractions and is a pure spoke of the path? It is that mind of the awakened ones, the mind which has been purified of distractions, the plain spoke of the path. The thoughts, thinking process, the mental attitude, reasoning, and the inclining of the mind, the direction of the mind, the giving of attention, and verbal activities, vachi sankaras, in one who develops the path. Or, um, yeah, in one who's, who has developed path, basically. Then one practices letting go of unwise intention and giving rise to wise intention or wise thoughts. Also, this is how sankapa can, can be translated, intention or thoughts, depending. This is a meditator's wise practice. So this is the right effort. With presence of mind, one lets go of unwise intention. With presence of mind, one gives rise to wise intention or wise thoughts. In this way, these three components always come around and revolve around wise intention. That is, wise understanding, wise practice, and wise presence of mind. So, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. And so, here from the very beginning, at this level of the mind, this is sitting meditation. Just to put things into perspective, what we're doing when we're sitting here on retreat is basically whenever there's a distraction arising, we just release, relax, bring up another smile, and then come back to the love. Um, that is working with intention. That is working with thoughts. We're cultivating wholesome mental states, basically. That's what that is. 
At that level, we are working at the mental level, basically on retreat. And this is where we are. This is our station right now. But then we will come out of retreat and speech will start again. Not tomorrow. Uh, I think I've, <laughs> I've taken the decision that tomorrow is not going to be a talking day again because this is a short retreat and maybe we want to make the most out of it. And so, uh, so tomorrow is going to be another silent day. But the next day will be a speech day, a wise speech day, hopefully. <laughs> and this is... Um, so basically the Buddha explained that speech is the closest thing to the mind. After the mind, there is speech. And see, even in the intention, there was Vachi Sankaras, basically the, men, the formations of, of speech, basically. But before that breaks into speech, it gets coarser and coarser and coarser, and then it breaks into speech, basically. So, just after the, this meditation, the next thing, and that's why it's so important to tell the truth, to be honest, to not be backbiting, to not use harsh words, that's just because this is, this is basically showing how the mind is. Uh, and if we simply let go of these manners of speech that are uh, unskillful, then we're also helping the mind being skillful. Uh, so we're basically rewiring the mind to be uh, wholesome. And this is affecting the mind as well. So speech is very important. And while going back home, this is the first thing you want to be conscious of, basically, mindful of, to be aware, to be present with the speech that you're using, basically. First, there must be wise understanding. One knows unwise speech as unwise speech, and wise speech to be wise speech. This is one's wise understanding. What is unwise speech? Speaking lies, spiteful speech, rough language, and useless talk. This is unwise speech, monks. What is wise speech? Now, there are two kinds of wise speech. The speech that is still under the sway of distractions, which is in training, and the speech which is the pure spoke of the path, the ideal wise speech. What is the wise speech in training? It is the abstention from lying, the abstention from spiteful speech, the abstention from rough language, and the abstention from useless talk. This is called, I, I like uh, some suttas, there's like a whole bunch of lists, and there's a big list of like talks that the, the Buddha said it was a tirachana katta, basically a animal talk. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, uh, um, uh, well gossips. And it's just funny because um, I just imagine like, uh, you know, like at, at the time of the Buddha, like one of the activities is like go get water at the well. And then he just like hang out by the well and talk about like useless things. And yeah, so I just like, it was like the, the, the pub of the time of the Buddha. I don't know, like, <laughs> like well gossips. I'm like, oh, okay. This is interesting. <laughs> How does that fit in? But yeah, just imagine. So, uh, okay, so the abstention of all these unskillful ways of speech. This is called wise speech, which is under the sway of distractions, uh, still in training. What is the wise speech, which is the pure spoke of the path? It is that mind of the awakened ones, the mind which, is, which has been purified of distractions, the plain spoke of the path. It is the non-performance, refraining, abstinence, and desisting from these four unwise ways of speech. Yeah, I guess this is, in English it's kind of, Pali is reversed in English, so it can be a little... So it's desisting and all that in a, in a mind that has been basically purified completely of, of this. So um, uh, whatever that uh, person might say, 
if it sounds harsh or if it sounds the intention is not to be harsh or it's not it's never uh, there won't be any useless talk basically because they don't really have anything to say that would be useless they would just keep silent basically so um, so that's the, the these four kinds of speech that are in the mind of an arahant basically Now, the cultivation of wise speech. One practices letting go of unwise speech and giving rise to wise speech. This is a meditator's wise practice, sorry. Uh, so basically doing, uh, doing this actively, letting go of wise speech when you're going to say something to someone. And uh, I like going because... Uh, Oh, you pig, oh, you horse, oh, you cow. Because he says, uh, I guess, I guess uh, you've probably seen his course in, uh, in Hindi, so I'm not sure if he says the same thing. But in English, he says, uh, I don't know what your, your insults are here, but in my country, <laughs> it's like, oh, you pig, oh, you cow, oh, you dog. <laughs> so, yeah, not, oh yes oh, okay oh yes yes dog yes 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 ah yes i just love that thing i just remember that for sure and i can't it's just such a <laughs> oh going kaji <laughs> he's a he's a funny one anyways so i just want to do another course just to listen to his talks you know <laughs> just to like, just to, I still have so much love for him. <laughs> it's not going to go away. <laughs> no, it's a... Um, it's a... Um, going kanupasi. Uh, remembering Goenka's... Goenka Ji's... And uh, being uplifted. Yes, when gladness arises, joy arises. When joy arises, the body calms down. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, in, it's important to have uh, love and respect for uh, all these traditions, I think. Uh, whatever we're going to practice, uh, I think if we're really practicing, uh, there's going to be love and compassion and respect. And that's, I think, showing that we're actually practicing. So, yeah. I'm not practicing exactly the same way that I used to practice with these traditions, but I still uh, have a lot of love and uh, gratitude for, for all of it. So, with, wise, with presence of mind, one lets go of unwise speech, and with presence of mind, one gives rise to wise speech. So we need the mindfulness to be able to put the effort into practice. This is a meditator's wise presence of mind. In this way, these three components always come around and revolve around wise speech. That is wise understanding, wise practice, and wise presence of mind. First, okay, so now we went from the meditation environment of uh, working with thoughts and mental behaviors and now we float into speech because that's the the closest to to the mind and now we go into uh, action basically first there must be wise understanding how one knows unwise behavior as unwise behavior and wise behavior to be wise behavior that is one's wise understanding everybody following it's a bit, huh? It's like a puzzle, isn't it? It's like Tetris. You're like, oh, okay. Good. For, for those of you who know Tetris, I don't know. <laughs> Neo's laughing. <Good. laughs> what is unwise behavior or unwise action? Harming living beings, taking what is not given, and inappropriate sexual conduct or sensual conduct, it, it depends, this word, like kami su mi chachara, 
doesn't necessarily mean sexual, it also means sensual. So it's a bit of a, like a gray area. So it, it can mean a lot more than just like a, a sexual misconduct. It can also mean uh, wrongly uh, indulging in senses. But uh, that's, uh, have you heard this interpretation before? Kamesu is just basically like the, the senses. Uh, technically, nowadays, it was like one of the things that came onto the topic was uh, basically we need another spoke of the path because now there, it would be like right social media. <laughs> we need like right social media. And because uh, <laughs> there's definitely this kind of like a side section that's kind of. And then uh, like right TV or like right. <laughs> And, and I actually, um, it's really funny because it already exists. If you go to Sri Lanka, um, there's, there's a TV channel, which is Samma TV. And uh, that, so that's already like if you want to have like the tenth spoke of the path and like, watch Samma TV, write TV, you just go to Sri Lanka and tune in. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> oh no, that's another thing. Uh, that's the TikTok. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some some people uh, came to my forest monastery, and I I I go around the Wewa, basically the lake, every every evening for the sunset because I like to walk there, just before the elephants come out, and uh, <laughs> and then they they took a shot of me, like a video uh, of me walking, and then. Uh, basically yeah they like made a video of it and it went viral on tiktok <laughs> and i was just not aware of this <laughs> anyways so yeah and then going to colombo like a month later and then this guy just shows it to me again and so yeah the things that happen to you when you come out of the forest <laughs> But yeah, there is a, there is right TV, and that exists, and it's in Sri Lanka. Um, so tune in, Samma TV. You you need to know Singhala though. Uh, so I can I can keep up a little bit. I, I understand a little bit, but uh, not all of it. So what is wise behavior? There are two levels of wise behavior. There is the wise behavior in training and the wise behavior that is the pure spoke of the path. What is the wise behavior which is still under the sway of distractions and is in still, in, still in training? That is the abstention from harming living beings, abstention from taking what is not given, and abstention from sensual misconduct. What is the wise behavior which is void of distraction, the pure spoke of the path? It is the non-performance, refraining, abstinence, and desisting from these three unwise ways of behaving or actions which are found in the awakened one's minds that have been purified of distractions. Then. How we cultivate this, one practices letting go of unwise actions and to give rise to wise actions. This is a meditator's wise practice or right effort. So see, we do this with every spoke of the path. This, of course, right effort is like the six R's in the meditation, but that's at the level of thoughts. But also, as it gets coarser and coarser, we do the same thing, basically, but with our speech, our actions, and then our, our livelihood, basically, which is like the big container of our lives. So a lot of people were asking on interviews and on side questions, like, how do I integrate this into my life? How, like, how do I deal with, uh, with Dhamma in my life? Uh, I'm not a monk. I don't want to be a monk. <laughs> And uh, this, is, this is answering uh, very well, you know, like uh, how the roots go into our lives, from the Dhamma into the, the ground of our lives. And the more we align with this, the more we align with the Dhamma. 
and uh, the, the closer we can stay with the Dhamma, basically, that's how it works. With presence of mind, one lets go of unwise actions, and with presence of mind, one gives rise to wise actions. This is a meditator's wise presence of mind, so we need the sati to do this. In this way, these three components always come around and revolve around wise action, that is, wise understanding, wise practice, and wise presence, presence of mind. Wise lifestyle. First, there must be wise understanding, monks. One knows unwise lifestyle to be unwise lifestyle and wise lifestyle to be wise lifestyle. That is one's wise. Understanding. Great. You guys are awesome. <laughs> You're following. <laughs> What is unwise lifestyle? That is fraud, bribe, soliciting, playing tricks. <laughs> I just like that one thing. <laughs> huh? Playing tricks, like <laughs> tricking people, basically. I, I could have write that. <laughs> yeah, like tricking people, like like fraud, like bribing, like, uh, you know, saying something that, oh yeah, like, uh, you just buy this and then you're, you'll get rich, you know, and it's not true, it's just going to break in two days. Uh, <laughs> uh, seeking profit for profit, basically. This is unwise lifestyle. What is wise lifestyle? There are two levels of wise lifestyle, monks. Somehow it's just funny that he's telling that to the monks. <laughs> because it's like, hmm. <laughs> How far is like monks going at that time? Like bribe and fraud, <laughs> like playing tricks. Hmm. Okay. Can't say I haven't seen that today. <laughs> yeah. Just don't talk about it. <laughs> There is wise lifestyle which is still under the sway of distraction, which is in training. And the wise lifestyle that is void of distractions or impurities, which is the pure spoke of the path. What is wise lifestyle which is still under the sway of distractions? Here, monks, a student of the awakened ones leaves behind unwise modes of living and brings effect to wise modes of living. I just always love that sequence. Clear as mud. <laughs> this is wise lifestyle, which is still under the sway of distraction. So basically what that means, if, if I'm not, uh, if I'm being more uh, serious, <laughs> um, is basically this is where we we have to choose you know this is where like you know like oh how, how do i do with my career how do i do like you you go the you go as virtuous as you can you go as uh as good as you can and then uh that's that's the one that is in training basically you're just trying to get there as much as you can it's never going to be a hundred percent perfect but you just do your best, basically. What is the wise lifestyle which is void of distraction and the pure spoke of the path? That is the refraining, abstinence, desisting from these three unwise ways of uh, lifestyle or, uh, or livelihood. Uh, that is found in the awakened one's mind that has been purified of all defilements, distractions. One practices letting go of unwise uh, lifestyle and gives rise to wise lifestyle. This is a meditator's wise practice. With presence of mind, one lets go of unwise lifestyle. With presence of mind, one gives rise to wise lifestyle. This is a meditator's wise <laughs> oh, good try. Starts with a P. Practice. 
N R N E. Presence of mind. Very good. Very good. Because we just said the wise practice, right? So that's good. I'll give it to you anyways, and then we pass the quiz. And so everybody's happy. Uh, I don't have my stickers. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The mental revolution. In this way, these three components always come around and revolve around wise lifestyle. That is, wise understanding, wise practice, and wise presence of mind. So we need these three, and these three turn around each of these spokes and purify them and make them clearer and better and more wholesome, basically. So, the ten-spoke path. First, there must be wise understanding, monks. How? Wise understanding leads to wise intention. And this is a really interesting sequence also, which is another great insight from that sutta. Wise understanding leads to wise intention. Wise intention leads to wise speech. Wise speech leads to wise action. Wise action leads to wise lifestyle. Getting coarser and coarser, but as we take care of the finer, the coarser also purifies. Wise lifestyle leads to wise practice. Wise practice leads to wise presence of mind. Wise presence of mind leads to wise collectedness. Wise collectedness leads to wise knowledge. And wise knowledge leads to wise liberation. And see, this is another place that's interesting where we find that it's not just liberation, it's samma vimutti. So that's another really interesting uh, little tweak to the Buddha's teaching here. It's not just uh, samadhi, it's samma samadhi. So it's not just liberation either, it's samma vimutti. So. It's not just any old liberation. <laughs> <laughs> any? Any old. Any old, yes, yes. yes. But it's true. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's a sutta where a Brahmin, like uh, the Buddha asks uh, this, this, uh, this, this Brahmin, what do you think is Nibbana? Because they're having a conversation and the Buddha is like, so he's noticing that he's like, mm. he says he knows my teaching, but I'm not sure. I, from what I'm telling, he's, there's things that he's not understanding properly. And he's like asking him, so what do you think is Nibbana? And he's like, well, He's like rubbing his legs and like, this is Nibbana, this is like, this is, this is Nibbana, this is the health, you know, like Nibbana is like, this is, this is good, like this is my health, you know, this is Nibbana. And he's like, no, this is not Nibbana, <laughs> this is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so these things are really interesting uh, <laughs> to know. <laughs> so, so the, the relatively important <laughs> for us to know. So, so this, this is not Nirvana, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> just saying. So that's, that's why the, the Buddha says like, there's right liberation. So this is not right Nirvana. <laughs> okay. I thought so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, at the time of the Buddha, you know, like there were so many different uh, spiritual practices, like the, the dog duty ascetics, you know, that like people would like act and behave like dogs, basically. And that was their spiritual practice, like to behave like dogs or like animals. And they would just like walk on all fours and like eat with their, eat with their face and tongue. And, you know, that there's like the Buddha, the Buddha had to break it to one of them that he was probably going to be reborn as a dog, or otherwise mm -hmm. go to one of the lower realms. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, it's, it's quite important to know these things, you know, like, there's so many different, you know, so many different understandings of, like, what spirituality is, what, you know, awakening is, what liberation is, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. In this way, <clears throat> The wise apprentice is endowed with 
eight qualities, well, basically the eight spoke path. And the fully liberated are endowed with ten qualities, the ten spoke path, which is with uh, right knowledge and right liberation as well. So uh, take that with a grain of salt in, in the Sanyutta Nikaya, in the, um, in the section of the path in the Magga Samyutta, basically. Um, there's a lot of suttas uh, that are actually talking about the tenfold path and that have this and so it's not just for fully awakened people but in this particular sutta the Buddha says it relates to that but everybody uh, that's accessible to everybody as well so when you read that uh, that chapter it, it, it becomes quite obvious um, Okay, the origination of the path. First, there must be wise understanding. How? From wise understanding, unwise understanding wears away. And the countless harmful, unbeneficial mental states that arise because of unwise understanding also come to an end. And the countless skillful mental states that arise because of wise understanding, these come to maturity by development. From wise intention, unwise intention wears away. So basically, he's going to go through the ten spokes here, but this is really highly repetitious. I'm just going to fly through this. Basically, when one cultivates the wise spoke, the unwise spoke becomes a Abandoned. So that's just how it works. It's like you either have love in your heart or you have uh, something else. But when you have love, you don't have anger or you don't have hatred. It's, these states are complete opposites. So when you choose one, you cultivate one, the other one wears away. And the countless skillful states that arise from this uh, become manifest. And the other ones that are unskillful fade away. And this is wholesome mental development. Okay, and the great 40 states. Like this, monks, there are, there are 20 states belonging to the wholesome and 20 states belonging to the unwholesome. This Dhamma discourse on the great 40 states, which has now been propounded, cannot be refuted nor turned back by any Shramanas or Brahmanas. In this world with its devas and maharas and brahma, should any renounce it or any shramana or brahmana think of blaming or disparaging this discourse on the dhamma of the great 40 states, then they offer themselves up to 10 counter arguments which are fully in line with the dhamma, the law of nature, the way things work here and now, upon which they will be contradicted. So basically, if you're speaking against wise, the wise path, you're speaking for the unwise path, basically. If you're speaking against uh, uh, killing living beings, uh, or uh, abstaining from killing living beings, you're basically for killing living beings. So it's that clear. Uh, and this, this is really hard to refute, basically. Uh, if one were to disparage wise understanding, then one's, one speaks in favor and praises unwise understanding. If one were to disparage wise intention, then one speaks in favor and praises unwise intention. If one were to disparage wise speech, then one speaks in favor and praises unwise speech. And like this, with actions, livelihood, with wise practice, if one were to speak about, uh, to disparage the wise spokes of the path, then they would be speaking in praise of the unwise spoke of the path, basically. Should any renunciate or Brahmin think of blaming or disparaging this discourse of the Dhamma of the great 40 states, then these are the 10 counter-arguments to which they offer themselves to. 
which are fully in line with the Dhamma, the law of nature, and the way the mind works, here and now, upon which they will be contradicted. Even these teachers from Okala, Vassa, and Banya, that propound philosophies of non-causality, like non-karma, non-action and non-result of action, nihilism, would not think to refute this teaching of the Dhamma on the great 40 states. Why? For fear of being criticized and refuted. This is what the Awakened One said, glad at heart the monks rejoiced in his words. All this to say that this is how the path works, this is how right effort, uh, right view, right effort, and right uh, mindfulness all work together as a team and purify the whole path. And when we are in training, cultivating the path and remembering that this all started from wise samadhi, wise collectedness. So all of this brings us to wise collectedness. And also, this is called wise meditation, basically. So wise meditation is not just sitting practice, it's also everything that we do in life. And the closer we are to the wise section of the path, then the closer we are to not only the path, but the easier the mind will become collected in that sense, because we're not forcing the mind to be one-pointed here, we are cultivating wholesome states, which culminate in a happy, collected mind. So when we take the Eightfold Path like this and go to the root of it, into every aspect of our life, then we can live our lives the way that we want to live it and harmonize as much as we can with the Dhamma and this will just nourish our life and uh, support our meditation practice. And the samadhi that we've been practicing here, which arises from joy, gladness, tranquility, and happiness, and then the mind becomes collected. This kind of samadhi is uh, very easy to maintain when we take care of this whole tree of the Eight Spoke Path here. And that works with everything that we do in life. Yeah, so I, I wanted to offer this uh, last sutta, this discourse on, uh, it's just a beautiful analogy of the path and how it works. It's compared to a chariot, basically. Uh, and it's a beautiful kind of mental image. Uh, to, to wrap up this talk on, on the, the eight spoke path, Basically, it starts as a venerable Ananda sees uh, the Brahmin Janusoni uh, in an all-white chariot going by in town. And he, venerable Ananda is just going around with his bow on alms. And uh, the chariot is harnessed to white mares and uh, it's leaving Savati. And uh, even its yokes and decorations are white. It's a white carriage with white accessories, white reins, a white driver stick, and white canopies. And the driver is wearing a white turban, white clothes, and white sandals, and being fanned by white feathered fans. So it's pretty white, <laughs> as you can tell. So it's, I, I mean, at that time, it must have been quite a show. It's like, oh, this is, you know, it's quite white. Anyways, <laughs> like bright white. Anyways, um, having seen this, he said, this carriage of yours is divine indeed, good sir. A heavenly sight, a heavenly vehicle. Then the Venerable Ananda in the afternoon went back to the Buddha and recounted the story to the Buddha and says, Bhante, would there be a way to compare this Dhamma practice to a divine vehicle? It is possible, Ananda. <laughs> that is an expression for the eight spoke path of the awakened ones, Ananda. That is the divine vehicle, the vehicle of the Dhamma. 
the unsurpassed victory in battle. Wise understanding, Ananda, when developed and practiced continuously, has the elimination of discontent, the elimination of anger, and the elimination of delusion as its final destination. Wise intention, wise speech, wise behavior, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation, Ananda, when developed and practiced continuously have the elimination of discontent, the elimination of anger, and the elimination of delusion as its final destination. In this way, it should be known that this is an expression for the Eighth Book Path, the divine vehicle, the vehicle of Dhamma, the unsurpassed victory in battle. Having said this, the Buddha said a few more verses. Both qualities of faith and discernment always yoked together evenly. With conscientiousness as the pole, mind as the rope, awareness as its careful driver. The complete body of virtue is the carriage, jhana its axle. Inspiration, the wheels. Steadiness of mind is the even alignment. The whole is covered over and draped in contentment. Goodwill and harmlessness, letting go as a third, are its weaponry. Forgiveness is the armor and protection headed to freedom from slavery. This divine vehicle, unsurpassed, arises from within oneself. With it, the wise leave behind this world, assured of the highest victory. So this is the end of this talk tonight. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, TK. The chair of merits. Uh, this is, oh, I don't have my book. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad.